Hello everyone and welcome back and in today's video we will be going to do a lesson over Kantian philosophy held within the prospect of the March-April LD resolution of Resolve. In a democracy, a free press ought to prioritize objectivity over advocacy. Before we begin, I'd just like to disclose that I am not an expert on Kantian philosophy, so forgive me if I say anything wrong or contradicting, and nothing is better than your own research. This video may be a little lengthy, so we'll see how it turns out. I understand that most LDers are taking the light framework route these days, but if you choose to run a philosophy route, then make sure you understand it. And just to note over Kantian philosophy, I believe this will be the most commonly used philosophy in today's debate. So let's go ahead and dive into the slide presentation. So in this video, we'll be talking about Kantian ethics, as that will probably be the most predominant framework tool in this topic among philosophical debaters which personally I've already debated this topic and I've had only one person use it, but in my district, not a lot of people are philosophically laden besides a couple few. And um, we will also look at a brief history of Immanuel Kant along with the ethics and teachings and the usage of the March-April topic. And next we'll also look at answers specifically to Kantian frameworks and answers to it if you're the opposite side along with tips in running philosophical frameworks. So we won't dive into too much detail over Kant's personal history, but we'll focus on some of his standpoints and critiques. So starting on the critique of pure reason, which is also probably the most used groundwork for this resolution. So the critique of pure reason seeks to determine the limits and scope of metaphysics. Essentially, metaphysics is like a branch of philosophy that studies the fundamental nature of reality, and the first principles being of like identity and change along space and time and casualty and necessity along possibility. And then the in the next preface to the first edition, Kant also explains that by having like a critique of pure reasons, he um, means to critique of the faculty of uh, reason in general in respect to, of like all knowledge after which it may strive independently of all experience. And he aims to reach a decision about the possibility or impossibility of metaphysics. So Kant builds on the work of imperialist, um, sorry, empiricist uh, philosophers such as like Locke and Hum, as well as like rationalist philosophers such as like Wolf and others. And he expounds on new ideas of the nature of space and time and tries to provide solutions to skepticism of Hume regarding knowledge of the relation of cause and effect and regarding the knowledge of the external world. Um, this is argued through the transcend, uh, yeah, transcendental idealism of objects in their form of appearance, as Kant regards the former as uh, mere representations and not as things in themselves, and the latter as only sensible forms of our institution, but not determinations given for themselves or contradictions of the objects as things in themselves. This basically grants the possibility of a priori knowledge since objects as appearance must conform to our um, cognition, um, which is to establish something that objects before they are given to us. And knowledge is independent of experience as Kant calls this a priori to knowledge while a knowledge obtained through experience is termed a, a post priori. So according to Kant, a proposition is a priori if it is a necessity and universal. And a preposition is necessary if it could not possibly be false, and so cannot be denied by like a contradiction. Um, a proposition is universal if it is at all true in all cases, and so um, he basically does not omit any of the exceptions. Um, knowledge gained by a priori through the senses, Kant argues, never imparts absolute necessity and universality because it always is possible that we might encounter an exception. In a debate, most people refer to this as the categorical imperative, which is a universal law, or a priori and a priori, as stated before, in which we should treat humans as ends in themselves. Or, I mean, shouldn't treat them as ends in themselves. In Kant's thought, the representation of a principle as a um, binding commitment is called a command, and the formula of this command is called an imperative. The imperative to the will um, there's like two different types, so as the priori and priori, we'll call one the imperative of the will and the imperative of conceptions. So the imperative of the will says that we must, when the will prefer to say what I want. And we do not have to obey the imperative of necessity, and the imperative appears at, as like a, a constraint. Um, Kant pointed out how a perfectly good will would have no need for imperative, 
um, because it would be necessarily what is in accord with the moral law. The hypothetical imperatives express with the practical necessity of an action as a means to achieve something you want or might want. And they're conditional. They express themselves of, if I want to do this, then I have to do that. And they express only what the action is good to accomplish for a particular purpose. So like for an example, if I want to nail something, so I have to use the hammer. It is clear that this has nothing to do with morality. The categorical imperative expresses um, that action is needed for itself objectively with no other purpose. The categorical comparative is not subject to any special conditions and is therefore still a valid whatever the circumstances. So for example, if I can show you that not to lie is a must, then I will always respect it, whatever the circumstances be, even if such like a murder wonder um, where lies like my friend or so on and so forth. In Kant, only the categorical comparative is moral. It is if the moral law and in fact none exists even if only one can receive several formulations. So there are two main formulations as stated before. And the first formulation of the categorical imperative says that we always act so that you can may also wish that uh, the maximum of your action become a universal law. This is to uh, like ask every time we act if we reasonably and without wanting to contradict that everyone acts in the same way. So for example, suppose I need money for a basic need, and then I borrowed knowing full well that I could never make it. I promise that I will make a moral that money knowing that if I do not promise, um, we need not to give me any, and yet I need it still. The question of morality of such an act amounts to asking whether it is possible to make a universal principle of false promise. But if so, whether any problem, uh, promise was false, no one would believe what I promise, and there would be no sense to promise. So consider the false promise as morality is contradictory. A second formulation of the categorical imperative states that an act in such a way that you treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of another, always as the same as an end, and never merely as a means. And your example is clear by the false promises I use in other means, I make him an instrument of my interest. Similarly, um, if you want to commit suicide is immoral because making an end of me means contributed to, li to live and not to destroy me. But um, how will the imperative may be used in the round is what you may be asking. So in Kant's categorical imperative, as talked about earlier, it says that in order to determine if an action is moral, then we must universalize the said action. And there's a formula of universability which we need to act only by the maximum wherein we can act in the action. So if something proves that within a reason it is unreasonable to do, then we shouldn't do it. It means that we should stop contradictions altogether. And as highlighted early, there are two types of contradictions, and we'll name them the contradictions of inceptions and the contradictions of the will. So in the contradictions of inceptions, this is essentially an ought implies can argument about how that it says that if we are at the end of an action, then I want to do the will, and the world will be completely inconceivable, and that makes the action immoral. So for example, lying's a purpose is to trick you, but if everyone lies, then you know that they're lying, so they can't trick you. And then this also ties into metaphysical issues, which is known, uh, which is also shown in the topic analysis video. And in prospect to this resolution, you could either say that it is an advocacy people lie, so universalizing that wouldn't tell everyone lying, or an objectivity, the truth hurts, so we shouldn't do that, and maybe tie in some like internal secrets and whatnot and jeopardize security that impacts. But you'd also have to tie in the part about how Kant specifically says that lying is bad, so that outweighs in the debate on the categorical comparative argument with the affirmative and the negative. And then for the contradictions of the will, it says that if I will end of an action and is universal, um, and the world is conceivable, but it's like really bad. So for example, I will that I will help no one, so no one helps anyone else, but that means that I also can't um, will something like getting groceries, since getting groceries needs help from someone else. So specifically in this resolution, you could talk about how the media ethics and the sensationalism and whatnot, uh, that it produces the consequences of that. And additionally, you could also show how these contradictions tie into the resolutional terms of democracy and how advocacy or objectivity is in contradiction to that definition. 
Khan also specifically shows how other consequences frameworks fail because he shows that actions have infinite consequences and so you can't predict every bad thing that will happen. And also Kant makes it where morality is not arbitrary and content ethics are more prescriptive while consequentialist frameworks are more descriptive. This is because content that framework draws us to a hypothetical reality while other frameworks make us look to like a prior consequences of an action. And since most of our solutions are hypothetical then we have to default to Kant and then also like if you include these preferences inside your constructive you can prove how Kant always any consequentialist framework very easily and make a short rebuttal speech by using these refutations. So answers to the content framework, um, now I wouldn't run any of these attacks against your opponent if both of you are running Kant, but if they are, you could say all the above if you aren't running the same thing, and we'll go into details of each one of these. So on a mission distinction, so basically a, a mission distinction is an internal action of the, like not to act, because Kant draws a line between killing and letting someone die when there is no difference as both require an agent to make a decision, so there's a mission distinction in that. And then if you're running a consequentialist framework, then you could like say that only consequentialism can link a system of value to a normative statement of what we ought to do. Because our capacity for pleasure and pain is what makes us valuable, and desire is what drives institutions, so without consequences, then all talk of value is completely empty. And then Kant also says that there's a difference between unintended and foreseen consequences, but if I like, basically for an example, if I throw a timer at someone and I intend it to hit the person and hit the floor, but I foresee it to hit the person in the face, then I'm still culpable for throwing the timer. So in the public sphere, the state is still culpable of their policy, but in the, but the, um, of their policy, but has the unintended consequences additionally. So there's still unintended consequences of universalizing an action, which only consequentialist frameworks can account for. And additionally, only consequentialism explains degrees of wrongness. So if I break a promise to meet up for lunch, that's not as bad as breaking a promise to take a dying person to the hospital. So only the consequences of breaking the second promise explain how it's so much worse than that of the first. Now since Kant is a deontology, you can point out that morals are not universal, because we are never really able to determine our law if we go directly off of what is moral to each person. We have different morals, so in light of law, the idea of deontology does not work. For example, um, people are racist and have racist morals, so thus if we defined what to do off of them, then we generally have immoral laws, and thus Kant is also immoral by universalizing an action. It is um, far also, and they are also dependent on people for stability. And then we have implications on what we can say that if the decision for a child to act under the guise of deontology is to allow for like basically 20 million die for an example, that does not like uh, quite equate to any sense of morals. While morality is important, we must allow this to factor into the implications of actions also. Now there are ethical problems with Kant, as Mills points out when he says um, that of Kant, but when he begins to deduce from his prospect of, of the actual um, duties of morality, he fails most grotesquely to show that there would be any contradiction, any logical, not to say physical, impossibility to the adoption of all rational beings of the most outrageously immoral con rules of conduct, which Mills says. So Mills basically says that he infers in this that Kant's framework is not applicable to real ethical problems. And additionally, some say that Kant's framework is incoherent because this objection is that Kant's basic framework is incoherent because his account for human knowledge leads to conception of human beings as being parts of nature whose desires, inclinations, and actions are susceptible of ordinary casual explanation. Yet his account of human freedom demands that we view human agents as capable for self-determination, and specifically for determination in ordinance with the principles of duty. And Kant is apparently driven by a dual view of man, because we're both a phenomenal beings and um, new nominal beings, and many of Kant's critics have held this to a dual aspect view of human beings because it's only incoherent. And while Kant's theory is not um, anthropocentric, uh, sorry, anthropocentric, yeah, its uh, implications raise the question of intrinsic value of the natural world coincide with most of the anthropocentric outlook. So it's no doubt that logically proper um, for Kantians to contemplate the possibility that like extraterrestrials and other kinds of his kind are rational autonomous agents, and if so, that they exist as ends in themselves. But whatever may be true of extraterrestrials, 
the Kantian case is closed regarding trees and rocks and streams and meadows and bison or, or beaver and so on and so forth. They do not exist as ends to themselves. So it only considers ends to themselves in, like a limitation to humans and not to nature. So if you're running like a different type of framework against that, you could just pretty much say, but the, those consequences matter as well. And then also they do not exist as ends themselves. And then also the category comparative test cannot be applied realistically. Another line of criticism is that where um, there's no action, which the categorical test can rule out. We need to only to invoke an arbitrary spe uh, specificity in order to let an action through the test. So, but then the idea is that I need to only describe my action arbitrary to determine its maximum to test the, pass the categorical imperative test. So basically the categorical imperative test cannot explain degrees of wrongness because some things might have a different degree of wrongness, like a person dying than a person being murdered. But in a consequentialist framework, we can identify these because of the consequences and the said action leading to that. And finally, you need to show how your framework solves for whatever issues you point out. Otherwise, you're at a moral standstill. So you need to show how their content ethics fill to your framework. Okay, and then now suppose that both you and your opponent run the same content framework. So these arguments will essentially be the same in which you either do an impact comparison or you concede the framework, or you just show how universalization is wronged on either side. So for the framework, you could say that lying is bad because it leads to metaphysical issues and has exacerbations in society by making where the public falls in unethical approaches by advocating and lying, which we stated earlier. While for the negative, you could say the truth can be bad and point out historical examples of objectivity leading to exacerbations and its threat to national security. And the problem with the negative is that Kant is specifically, I'm sorry, that on, yeah, so on the negative, Kant is specifically against the lying. So the problem with the negative is not really uphold inside the negative case as much as is in the affirmative. And of course, both sides can show how democracy is not being upheld by having objectivity or advocacy. But once again, if you make that democratic argument, you need to show how alternative, how your side solves. And then additionally, you need to um, negate the argument about prioritize because a lot of firms will bring this up in the debate. Now, in conclusion, if you ever want to do research of philosophy, then I recommend the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, but nothing beats like the original work of the philosopher, although some websites make it more understandable for everyone. The great thing about philosophy is that it's moldable. Don't let like someone trip you up on something that your philosopher said or did in his life. No person is perfect and sometimes their action depends on societal norms. And then next, be sure that your side solves for whatever you may bring up against your opponent's side. Be sure that your attacks don't flow onto your framework as well if you're running similar philosophers and philosophies. And uphold your framework the whole debate. I understand that the framework debate is slowly losing its value in LD since most don't understand it and whatnot. But to minimize confusion, then you'll need to explain your framework and your attacks against theirs. And you need to make it where it's understandable for everyone from your opponent and yourself to the parent judge that you might or might not have. And that draws us to the end of our video. The next video will be over the uh, tournament review since I actually went to a tournament just today and yesterday. And I'll highlight over the things people ran along with the route in which they took throughout the debate. So um, please smash that like and share and subscribe button. Keep notifications on and comment below if you have any topic suggestions for me to cover or input or questions. Thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one.